Recording, recording is on. Good morning and welcome everybody to VC309, our class on urban church planting. Thanks for uh, connecting to the class today. I take a moment just to pray and get started. I'm sure the others will come in very soon. Um, can somebody pray with us and we will get started? Who would like to pray? Okay. Um, oh, thank you. Go ahead and pray. Okay, let's pray. Uh, Holy Father, we thank you uh, this morning. Uh, we pray for that your Holy Spirit will guide us, will open our heart, and to keep us, Lord, uh, awake so that we may hear what you're about to be taught today. And we pray, Father, that you empower us as it, that he will be your mark, Lord. And whatever he teaches us today, Lord, may be uh, use, use, useful for, for the ministry uh, up ahead. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Good morning once again, and welcome to um, the class here on urban church planting. I'm going to go ahead and share the um, PDF, Let's do a quick review of what we've uh, covered last week and go forward from there. So last week, as we were um, continuing our journey in learning some practical things on urban church planting, we emphasize the importance of trying to understand the uh, the natural dynamics of urban center, or, or, the, or the place where you're going to be planting the church or starting the work. And uh, some other things that uh, we should try and uh, do a little research, become familiar with, uh, you know, some background of the city and understand the political, the economic, the demographic, the social, economic, education matters, and other things that would be important uh, in relation to the city. And we also, you know, said that in trying to, in understanding uh, this, it gives us a feel for the city so that we can pray for the city. And also, you know, God will help us, give us ideas, and he will also guide us. And some of it we can just arrive, we will arrive at through our interactions and prayer and discussion with people on specific areas that we are going to be uh, reaching or ministering towards as we serve the people in our city. So that comes out of this whole um, uh, homework that we do in trying to understand what's going on in the city. And we also emphasize that, you know, uh, the city is dynamic, it's not static. In fact, it is, it changes very rapidly. So we need to keep up our pulse on the, uh, uh, keep our finger on the pulse of the city that means stay in touch with what is happening. Be very open, you know, just as you're moving around the city, you know, stay in touch with what's going on, be very aware what's happening in the city, the needs that are coming up in the city, and so on, so that we can respond uh, very quickly to the needs of the people, and those will become areas of ministry in the city. Now, as opposed to the city, uh, a smaller town or a village uh, may develop or change much slower. So, you know, uh, in a village, things may move quite slowly. It may not be that drastic or dramatic a change. Um, that we see. So, uh, you know, uh, it, the, the whole approach may be a little different. But as in the city, we need to be in touch because things can change very quickly. So we talked about that. And uh, then we are going to go into chapter six today, where we want to look at, in a similar way, we want to look at the spiritual dynamic of urban center. So just as we are, uh, you know, we are constantly in touch with, and we have to be constantly aware 
of the natural things happening in our city, we also have to be in touch with the spiritual side of things over the place, the city, where we are going to plant the work and, and uh, you know, start out the ministry. Again, here, uh, we need to, um, you know, it's a, it's a constant thing. It's an ongoing thing, right? That we are constantly aware, constantly being sensitive to what is happening in the spiritual side of things over our city. Now, uh, to, you know, from, a, from a biblical perspective, we look at the scripture. Uh, Revelation chapter 2 uh, very, is very interesting. Uh, in Revelation chapter 2, we read about, um, you know, chapters 2 and 3, we read about the seven churches that the Lord Jesus is speaking to. So just try to imagine in your mind, you know, way back in time. So this is uh, just, you know, towards that uh, first hundred years of the church. So let's say the church was started in AD 30. We are now, you know, less than 100 years. So we're now somewhere around 80, 80 to 80, yeah, around 80, 80, uh, you know, uh, so on. Uh, uh, before 80, 90, but before John wrote this. So we are in that time frame. So we are approximately 50 to 60 years after the birth of the church in Jerusalem. Okay. So it's, it's rather a short time, 50 to 60 years after the start of the church in Jerusalem. So now the gospel has spread and there are several churches all across the region. And the Lord Jesus is speaking very specifically in Revelation chapter two and three to seven churches that were all located in and around the church at Ephesus. So this is really in a modern day situation in our time this would be on the west coast of the nation of Turkey. So, you know, if you imagine in your mind the map, the world map, Turkey as a country, if you go to the west coast, it is uh, just, you know, along the Mediterranean you know, Aegean Sea, on the coast, there is a port city called Ephesus. And not too far from Ephesus, within just, you know, about uh, less than 50 kilometers from Ephesians in different directions, you've got six other churches. So they're not very far away. You know, they're, they're all kind of in a cluster, clustered in that area. And you've got these totally, Ephesians plus six other seven churches. What is interesting is, uh, um, you know, as Jesus speaks to these seven churches, he is pointing out spiritual things that are happening in their city. So to the church in Smyrna, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, Jesus is telling them, now do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. But be faithful unto death, I will give you the crown of life. So he's telling them, so, so the devil is operating in your city. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. And he's, he's speaking to these believers in that city of Smyrna. And he's saying, you know, the devil is at work there. And he's going to cause them problems. Uh, he's, in fact, he's, some, of, some of you are going to be put in prison because of what the devil is about to do. You know? So there is a spiritual dynamic happening in that city, which the Lord Jesus is very aware of, and which he's, he's speaking about to the church. Think about the church in Pergamon. Now, Revelation 2, verses 13 and 14. Uh, he's telling them, in a, can somebody read that? Revelation chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, please. Go ahead. I know your works and where you go, where Satan strong is, and you hold fast to the name. And did not me. My faith, even the days in which Atticus was my faithful martyr, who is still among you where Satan dwells. But I cannot be against you, because my prayer, those who hold up to my father, who thought the father took a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat, take sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. 
Yeah. So, Jesus speaking to the church in Pergamon, what's he telling them? He's saying, you know, you are in a place where Satan's throne is and where Satan dwells. Right? So, Jesus looking at that city and he's saying, hey, in your city, Satan has got a throne. That means the people of the city have been involved in, you know, whatever kind of activity, and they've actually built a throne for Satan. I mean, like Satan is king in that city. That's what Jesus is saying. And he is saying that, uh, you know, he also knows that um, there's been a martyr, and to pass, there's been a martyr in that city. So Satan is dwelling in that city. Satan has a throne in that city. And then he's also he's just pointing out even the false doctrines. See, the Lord Jesus is very aware of what's going on in the city. He's saying in verse 14, uh, there are those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, the teaching of Balaam, meaning there is teaching going on that is prevalent in the city, which Jesus refers to as a teaching of Balaam, meaning you know, what Balaam in the Old Testament taught Balak and how to make the people of Israel sin. So, you know, when Balak wanted Balaam to curse the people, he said, look, I can't curse and God is blessed, but I can tell you of how to get them into a place of, you know, um, in, into a place where they can miss God, which is he basically got them all into immorality. So that was the doctrine of Balaam, the teaching of Balaam. And so he's saying here, yeah, you know, that same kind of teaching is prevalent in the city and is actually coming into the church. And people in the church are uh, being, you know, uh, seduced to commit immorality and to worship uh, and, and, and idolatry, to worship that. So Jesus is watching over the city and he's, 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 he's pointing out the spiritual dynamic. Satan is enthroned. Satan is dwelling in your city. And also there is this false teaching that is trying to creep into the church. The teaching where it is causing people to commit immorality and idolatry. The church in Thyatira, uh, chapter 2, Revelation 2.20, similarly, Jesus points out, Revelation 2.20, he's calling out a prophetess. Her name happens to be Jezebel. But this prophetess is at work in the church. She's somehow gotten into the church and she is teaching them the same thing. She is teaching the people to commit immorality and idolatry. And the Lord Jesus says, no, I've been patient, given her time to repent, but she and those who are, are with her, you know, uh, who've, uh, who embraced her doctrine, uh, they're going to be judged. And uh, in chapter 3 and verse 9, uh, Jesus is speaking to the church in Philadelphia, and he tells them, very interestingly, he says, you know, you're, you are in the city, Philippians 3 verse 9, where there is the synagogue of Satan. And the synagogue simply means the assembly. So there are these people who are really people of the devil. You know, the synagogue of Satan. There's a group that belongs to Satan. And Jesus is telling them, I'm going to cause this group to come and bow before the church. They will worship at your feet and they will know that I have loved you. You know, definitely we'd, we'd all love to um, be like a church in Philadelphia, you know, where this group that belongs to the devil, they come and bow before the church, or they bow down, they worship at our feet, and they acknowledge that the one who is in us is greater than the one who is over them. But think about all these churches. So these are believers in different cities. And to each city, Jesus is detailing what is going on in the spiritual realm in the city where the church is. So, 
would the Lord Jesus speak to you and me today about similar things concerning the cities in which we live? Just think about it. What do you think? Do you think the Lord can speak to us? Do you think the Lord can reveal to us certain things of what's going on in the spiritual realm? In our cities? Or was that only for Revelation chapter 2 and 3? What do you think? Anyone? Okay. Uh, I see two yeses, three yeses. Okay. All right. So I just want to impress on our heart that you know, what we're seeing in Revelation 2 and 3, as the Lord is speaking to these seven churches, he is pointing out the spiritual condition in which that community of believers is, you know, exists. He's very aware and he's telling them, this is what is going on spiritually in your city. Now, today's cities are many times bigger than the cities in the Bible, of course. You know, the cities in the Bible times had maybe a few hundred, maybe a few thousand, a few thousands of people. Uh, today, uh, our cities have millions of people. Big, you know, it's very complex, like we said. And so the spiritual dynamic over our city is also considerably complex because there are various uh, factors that are at work. There are people who are engaging in all kinds of practices. Uh, there may be uh, a, 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 a multiplicity of religions being practiced, a multiplicity of uh, ideologies that are being embraced in the city, a uh, multiplicity of uh, thought. Uh, and uh, um, uh, things that are people follow, philosophies that people follow. So today's cities are very complex, complex, which also means that spiritually there's a lot of different kinds of activity going on in the city. Satan is operating in many different ways in the city, many different ways. And so, God is going to call, and also in the city, we need to mention this, also in the city, there are many different churches and many different ministries. And therefore, churches and ministries will be assigned by God, will be mandated by God to address specific areas of the spiritual condition over that city. And collectively, the citywide church can engage in the citywide spiritual war. Right? So individually, churches and Christian ministry, churches, ministries will be anointed and gifted and mandated by God, called by God to address specific spiritual conditions of the city. Now, we all have a common goal, which is to preach the gospel and get people saved. But in the process of doing that, God is going to work through various churches, various ministries that are in the city to address various problems. And collectively, we should be engaged in the battle for our city. Okay? So modern day cities are complicated. There are diverse kinds of operations of the enemy over the city. And as, as you begin to go in there, you need to be aware, you know, what, what are you going to encounter based on where you're going to be positioned, based on the group of people that you're going to try to reach, and, uh, you know, what are the demonic kind, kinds of demonic things you're going to battle, you're going to come against, depending on where you engage in the city and whom you're trying to minister to in the city, uh, we need to be prepared. Okay. 
So that's kind of the, the thrust of what we are saying in this chapter is um, just like we, uh, sorry, just like we prepare ourselves to understand the natural dynamic of the city, we must also be aware of the spiritual dynamic in the city in which we are going to start the work. Now, we can also see some of these things in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, uh, we read about a spiritual being that is demonic powers or influencing leaders over the city. And in, in, in 1 Chronicles 21 and verse 1, we see that Satan uh, moved or instigated David. David was king. Right? He instigated, he moved David, provoked David to do something against God. Now, the enemy was, the point I want to bring out from there, First Chronicles 21, one is the enemy was provoking or instigating or influencing a leader. And the leader's decision eventually impacted uh, the people under him. Right? Uh, so would the enemy do something similar today? Very positive. Uh, we see about what happened uh, as far as Babylon is concerned, and you can take time to go to these passages where we see demonic powers influencing leaders. Uh, the king over Tyre and Sidon in Ezekiel 26, 28. Again, there is the natural king and there is the spiritual power operating over that region. Right? That means even natural leaders over cities, over territories, can come under influence, demonic influence, to to cause something bad or evil or wicked to be done in that city. So how are we going to recognize spiritual demonic influence and what kind of demonic activity is taking place in the city? We can get to learn some of this. Of course, one is by revelation, Holy God will reveal to us. God will open our eyes concerning certain things. But also, we can recognize the spiritual dynamics over the city if we are careful to observe how they are being expressed in the city. Some of the ways you will find it expressed, one is through culture, through cultural forms, which is the music, the dance, uh, other you know, cultural expressions, through that, what is coming forth? You know, what are the words, what are the music, what are the expressions, what is its effect on the people? You can see. So the culture only becomes a conduit or a vehicle, but through that, certain thoughts, certain ideas, certain uh, emotions are being expressed and released to the people. And we can be sensitive to that and recognize that there is a spiritual influence that is coming through. Okay. So by looking at um, culture, uh, by also looking at the social geography, as, as you find, you, know, you will find certain religious groups located in certain areas or certain areas of the city are having dominant ideologies and philosophies there then it's okay, you know, I'm seeing a lot of people in this part of the city who are given to this kind of ideology or this kind of a religious system or this kind of a belief system. So in certain part of the city, that's the influence, the dominant influence over there. We can also see, uh, you know, demonic influence being expressed through the moral values, uh, through other expressions like addiction and trafficking and you know, suicide and crying. Uh, and so when you look at these things, you can say, okay, uh, it seems like uh, this is how there is, this is the kind of influence over the city. And this is where, you know, demonic powers are engaging and trying to influence the people and push upon the people. Uh, and uh, sometimes they're using these ideologies to blind the people from being uh, receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you know, in time past, in time past, especially back in the, um, I would say, in the 80s and 90s, 1980s, 1990s, especially, 
Uh, there was a big uh, uh, movement in the Christian church on spiritual mapping uh, uh, in relation to spiritual warfare. You know, people used to go and they used to do very detailed studies about cities and regions, and they look at every little thing and they say, okay, therefore, this is the spiritual influence over a city. Now, uh, uh, this is my take on that, uh, and we're free to disagree. But I, I, I felt when, you know, when those books were written, and, and these are by respectable people, I've read some very few of those books and all of that. And, uh, and so I'm not you know, against the individuals, the godly men of God, men and women of God. But what I felt was it was a, a very narrow view of uh, spiritual mapping. It was actually a very narrow view of trying to understand what's happening in the city because you know, how it went, is, uh, usually when you, read, when, you, when you would read some of those books, it would be like, oh, uh, you know, uh, in this city there is one ashram. Uh, so therefore, there is one Maharishi who is influencing the city, or in this city there is one, you know, temple or one mosque or something like that, and therefore there is that kind of an influence in the city. But, you know, I, I, that would be a joke when compared to what you would find in India. And you know, if you come to one of, one, a city in India, you'd find probably a temple on every street, and you'd find an ashram or a, you know, a religious place like in every every nook and corner of the city. So you're not dealing with one temple or one ashram. You know, there are probably thousands of temples and thousands of or hundreds of if not, you know, religious centers all across the city. So everything changes now because you can't be doing spiritual map in the way as described in those books because here, if you're going to map every temple and every uh, ashram in the city, you'll be spending several you know, decades. I mean, you, you'll just be spending a lot of time wasting time on that. So that's why I, I felt that, you know, when you're reading those books on spiritual mapping and so on, it kind of was, was, was very, was not in touch with reality in terms of how things happen in other in cities in other parts of the world. Uh, you know, so uh, it was kind of a disconnect from what actually happens. Um, but I think what we should be focused on is we recognize that there are demonic influences prevailing in every city and in, across the city. And when we go in to do ministry, we must prepare ourselves to, conf be, you know, to confront, to engage spiritually uh, with these demonic powers and what they may intend doing or what they are doing in, in, uh, in the places where we are going to engage, right? So, I just want to open this up for a little bit of time here. And, and so uh, this one, one side note here is that, you know, we, uh, we are not necessarily encouraging and practicing spiritual mapping uh, as, you know, as you'll find in some of these books. Um, uh, 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 like I said, it's just sometimes just impractical. It's just time consuming and un un unprofitable. Um, you know, instead, listen to the Holy Spirit and move with the Spirit of God and show how to confront what the devil is doing in your specific area of work in ministry. Right? So that would be uh, basically the key takeaway here, is listen to the Holy Spirit and then move with him on how to deal with what needs to be addressed. Okay. Now, I, I, I will give a scriptural reference uh, a little later on from Matthew 12, but I want us to... Um, uh, you know, just open up a little bit of time here, uh, uh, just for people to share. Uh, uh, have you, you know, just from your experience in the city, uh, have you observed a natural expression which was indicative of a spiritual, corresponding spiritual dynamic that was taking place? Right? Just to correlate, just to correlate. Uh, 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 something that was happening in the natural, in the city, uh, which you recognized that it is connected to a spiritual movement over the city, that means demonic uh, happening in the city, and, and how you were able to correlate the two. I just want to open up uh, a time for sharing. Anybody wants to share that? Um, 
Okay. Uh, I just saw some comments there from Christopher. Uh, uh, sorry, I just saw it now. Is my voice okay? Everybody's okay? You can hear my voice. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Charles. Do you put your hand up for something you want to share? All right. Uh, thank you so much, Pastor, for the opportunity. Um, we were in 2016, there was a motion that was aired in the parliament of the Republic of Uganda for the Islamic banking. And in the Islamic banking, they, they wanted to, to man, they wanted to make sure that the, the banking sector in Uganda is governed by Muslims. And in the physical realm, uh, the, the Muslims had organized uh, a sacrifice, they had organized a, a, a prayer meeting in the southern, the southwestern part of Uganda on a mountain called Mount Mohavula, so that uh, they would be able to sacrifice, they sacrificed 10 cows, um, so that they control from the south to the north, from the south to the east, from the south to the west. That's where they had decided to conduct their, their sacrifice. So um, in the spiritual realm, the, the Uganda shooting, the things were really going down and even the, the Muslims who had the, controlled the, the, the meat industry, they had controlled things where you would see that for sure the um, transport sector is taken by uh, the Muslims, the, the butchering industry is taken by Muslims, now the banking is going to be taken and they are putting the, the bill in parliament so that the Islamic banking should take lead. And you would find that spiritually the, 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 the Christians are no longer in business. So we had to, 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 to organize uh, overnight conferences and we would be praying and we would be counseling. And uh, at the end of six months, the, the bill was not allowed uh, spiritually because we had prayed and then even the, the leading agencies that were manning the banking sector, then their banks were also frozen. So I think that's what I can come up with in connection with mm. the physical, but also with the spiritual. Thank you. Mm. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Charles. Um, anyone else? you'd like to share. Thank you for sharing that. It's, 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 it's nice for us to hear and learn from that. Um, I do see Abraham's question, which is, uh, if you recognize it, how do you deal with it? Um, yeah, so I'm assuming, Abraham, you're talking about uh, if we recognize, you know, some, you know, something happening in the natural, we know it's something demonic, how, how should we deal with it? Uh, and so I think part of the answer uh, Charles already shared is, you know, the church is coming together and praying. Uh, church is engaging in prayer. Uh, uh, or for that, or, you know, sometimes you just don't bother because you know they cannot prevail in certain, certain matters. They don't matter. Uh, you just, okay, they're creating noise, creating, it doesn't, it's not going to really affect anything. Leave it alone. Sometimes, you know, you need to, if it's going to impact our lives, you know, the lives of people, the citizens in, the, in that particular city or country, and it's going to impact. And then, of course, we engage in prayer. So, and, and, and take it up, uh, and, and then through prayer, we deal with that. Okay, so I'm not saying every little thing you, you kind of want to react to it, so we pick our battles, because our, our real goal is to get people saved, preach the gospel. So we choose our battles, and if, if, if there's going to be an impact on the church, it's going to be an impact on the people, yeah, definitely we need to exercise our authority. Okay, so uh, 
like Charles, any other questions? I mean, any other you know, example that you could share your people have experienced or observed? Hello, can I share? Ah, oh, Kennedy, go ahead. In a locality, uh, there was the issue of trying to legalize same marriage. And it was taken to parliament. And uh, as Christians, we prayed over it. And the bill never went through. Mm -hmm. And uh, the person who was pioneering, the idea he even died. Mm -hmm. And we I think it was really affected. It affected mainly the youths because they had targeted the young ones, they are married, and they are being enticed to join that issue of same marriage and homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we prayed. Mm -hmm. We prayed for those kids, and everything stopped. The bill never went through. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so let, let's just give a biblical you know, reference point for this. Uh, we know, and both these passages are from Ma the, the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew 12, verse 29, Matthew 12, verse 29, Jesus said, and I, you know, um, how can you enter a strong man's house and spoil his goods unless you first bind the strong man? then you will plunder his house. So the context, of course, is dealing with demonic powers because in verse 28, Matthew 12, 28, Jesus said, if I by the spirit of God cast out demons, no doubt the kingdom of God has come to you. And then he continues, verse 29, how can you enter a strong man's house and spoil his goods unless you first bind the strong man, then you will spoil his goods. So what is the idea in here? The idea is, there's a strong man who's got goods under control, under his control. So you want to dispossess him of his goods, what must we do? First deal with a strong man. Then we can remove the goods. We can set people free. So in a spiritual sense, when we are planting a work, and it's a spiritual battle, so we need to deal with that spiritual influence. But there are ways to do this. We will talk about it later and I'm sure you've also learned it in, in the earlier course on prayer and intercession. So there are ways to deal with the, the influence, the demonic influence holding people, uh, multiple ways to deal with it. But that's the goal, to deal with a strong man so that people can be willing. The second passage that we're going to refer to is Matthew 16, 18 and 19, where, you know, the Lord Jesus clearly said, you know, Matthew 16, 18 and 19, he said, you know, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So he said, I will build my church, the gates of the Lord prevail against it, and I'll give the keys of the kingdom of heaven to, and to the church, the people of God. And we have the authority to bind on earth and to lose on earth, right? And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But we have to confront the gates of hell, the demonic power center. So that's another reference where the church which is God's people. So whether in your particular area of ministry or the church together in the city, confronts demonic powers through prayer, through intercession, and through the other weapons that God has given to us, which is through praise, um, through the proclamation of the word, uh, through uh, ministering the truth into the society, into the, the lives of people. These are ways by which we advance the kingdom and dispossess uh, the strong man, right? So prayer is one, there is praise, and there's also the proclamation of God's word, and there's a bringing of truth into society, bringing the truth into the lives of people, which will bind the strong man and dispossess uh, what he is in front. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that um, one of the, you know, personally, one of the amazing journeys uh, or stories that I've experienced was way back when I was in college in Manipal. That's where I uh, I was. Um, I did my engineering, my bachelor's. So Manipal is a small student community, you know, uh, far, uh, not too far from the city of Bangalore. That's where I did my bachelor's. 
And uh, so in Manipal, in, uh, uh, in my third year in college, uh, we had uh, started a, this, this fellowship of, you know, where we were teaching the word and getting people to come together. And around the same time, we also started a weekly time of prayer. A small group of us would go and we went. So Manipal is kind of a hilly area. So we'd go to uh, uh, the edge of the uh, hill, which just kind of went down and could look straight into the um, the uh, Arabian Sea. Yeah, to the Arabian Sea. So uh, you could look out there and see, look at the sea in a distance from the edge of the hill slope. So our goal was every Saturday, Sunday morning, uh, a, a small group of us, less than 10 people, sometimes it's five people, six people, seven, less than 10 people, would go there and 6 a.m. to about 9 a.m., sometimes till 10 a.m., so about three to four hours, we would be there in worship and prayer for Manipal. And Manipal was just a student community at that time. Uh, today, of course, it's, it's evolved and developed into a, into a, into a, into a much you know, a more developed place. But those days, it was just, you know, all students, you know, call, medical college, engineering college, dental, law, all different students. That was the community there. And uh, so we, and we, and our, our, our prayer was, you know, we were praying for the, the town of Manipal. We prayed for students to come to faith. We're praying for, you know, a move of God in the, in, in the town of Manipal. So we did that for, uh, uh, you know, so for al almost a, a year, we would be doing that. And, uh, you know, rain or shine, we were there. You now, there were times when some of us would go on leave, but the others would continue praying, you know. So we did that now. And then finally, uh, a year or a year and a half later, I graduated. I left Manipal. But what we did see it happen in Manipal, so the, the, the fellowship continued. And um, in the following year, uh, there was just a, a powerful work that took place. and. Uh, from a group of, let's say, about 30 students gathering together, the group just exploded to, you know, 100, 150, and it crossed 200. So I don't know what the final number was, like 200 and 250 people, students gathering together. So the, it just grew powerfully. So many people got saved. So many people got, and these are all students, college students. They all got filled with the Holy Spirit and a strong fellowship within two years from that time. A strong fellowship was established in that community. And it was just an amazing work. And part of, you know, what I would, uh, uh, you know, uh, what I would ascribe that for, it too, is I would say, look, we have spent over a year or a year and a half every Sunday morning praying for this town of Money Park. And now, you know, we see this, the outcome of that spiritual engagement in, the, in, in seeing so many people come to faith and, and our, our lives being touched. So that was just an amazing uh, experience uh, during our college days uh, to see God move and God work uh, in that manner. Right? So, uh, uh, so, so what we have covered so far is as part of our preparation to start the work, to plant the work in a city, it's good for us to um, engage both in understanding, let me just go back and share the idea, in understanding the natural dynamics and also the spiritual dynamics over a city. Be aware of this and be, you know, be constantly in touch because things are going to change. Now, before we transition into the next section, uh, just a quick overview of you know what we see in the book of Acts as far as urban church planting. You see that in the book of Acts, when you start off with chapter one, uh, you know the apostles were all waiting in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was a major city, right? and at that time, the Holy Spirit was poured out at a time when uh, there were lots of people gathering in in the city of Jerusalem. Acts chapter two. Right? This was the time. Uh, of the feasts, there was a uh, feast of uh, Pentecost. A lot of people are gathered. So the church was first 
strengthen a strong work was established in Jerusalem. But also because of the fact that there were so many visitors in Jerusalem at that time, there were people definitely who carried that to many other parts uh, of Asia from where they came. But what we see from Acts chapter 2 is uh, in Acts chapter 8, when there was persecution, the gospel was, was forced out of Jerusalem into neighboring cities, towns, and villages. So we see in Acts 8, they're going all the way to, they go to Samaria. Uh, we know in Acts 11, they go all the way to uh, the city of uh, uh, Antioch in, in uh, Syria, uh, the Antioch up north. And uh, so um, the gospel is being spread city by city. It is just going across cities. In Acts 13, when Paul and Barnabas begin their first missionary journey, they cross the sea, they go to the island of Pat, uh, to island of Crete, and they come to the city of Paphos. So here again, they're targeting cities. You know? And so as the apostles were moving, of course they would have stopped in smaller villages and towns, but in the book of Acts records cities being reached with the gospel. In Acts 17, you know, they go to Thessalonica, they go on into uh, Athens, then they go on into Berea, uh, they go on into several different cities. Acts 18, they come into Corinth, uh, and uh, they are they come also into Ephesus. All these are major cities, Athens, uh, Corinth, and Ephesus. All these are major cities in and around that area. And so, uh, and then Acts 24, Paul himself goes over to Caesarea and then on to Rome. So, uh, by the time we come to the end of the book of Acts, at least 50 major cities in and around the Mediterranean have been reached with the gospel. Right? So I'm saying at least 50 major cities. Right? Um, uh, definitely lots of towns, lots of villages, many, many places. But the major cities in and around the Mediterranean have been reached with the gospel. So what are we saying? That the great commission Jesus gave in Acts 1.8 go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth, definitely involve taking the gospel to the major urban centers in, in, in that time. And the big advantage is when something happens in a city, it immediately spreads everywhere else because in the city, people are coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. And if they are impacted, they're going to carry it to you know wherever village or town they came from. Now, the closing thought I want to leave us with this, us is with this. Today, the scale of that dynamic has become global. In Bible times, people moved from neighboring villages and towns, they came into the city for transaction purposes. And they came to sell the products, they came to buy things, they went back. Today, the dynamic is global. People are moving in and out of cities on a global scale, right? So most cities, more urban, most urban centers are like that. There are people, for instance, in one city, there could be people coming from almost all other cities in that country. They could be coming to that one city. So if you're doing ministry in one city, you are most likely going to impact all the other major cities in that country. Most likely, because there are going to be people coming in from so many other cities into that one city. And not only that, if the city where you're going to do ministry is, uh, you know, uh, has some global influence, you are likely, people are going to likely move globally, right? So you may be impacting, you know, you may be planning a work in a city, but the impact of what you do can be felt in many other parts of the world today. Right? So what we see happen in the book of Acts is just scaled up many times over, uh, the possibility is scaled up many times over what can happen today. So the fulfilling of, of Acts 1.8 is, is, is happening over and over and over again as people uh, engage in urban church planting uh, in different parts of the world. Okay, so that's the 
tremendous potential that is there in, in, in their doing missions of, of planting work, starting a work in an urban center. You're most likely going to impact your entire nation and possibly many other nations by what you start to do. Okay? So I'll leave us with that thought. We'll pause here. Um, next week, I'll start talking about all the practical steps, you know, getting into all the practical things uh, that go into urban church planting uh, ministry. Okay. Uh, so we close in prayer. Um, can I request somebody to pray with us as a class and then dismiss us, please? Anyone? Right. I see Abraham's comment. Uh, there are 20 people, but they are from four countries. Actually, they're in four countries. See that. Thanks for sharing. Okay, go ahead, Abraham, or somebody could just close in prayer. I will pick this up next week. Okay, Pastor, thank you. Uh, precious Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for all that we have learned. We thank you for the understanding about our cities and our nation. Father, we pray that you grant us the wisdom to deal wisely with all these principalities and powers and darkness, Father, that at the end of it all, you will reign and rule in righteousness. Father, we pray that the grace that came with your word today will be part of us, that will walk in the consciousness, knowing that you are with us and everything we are doing is for your glory and your honor. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you, Abraham. Thank you, everyone, for being in the class today. I look forward to seeing again on Thursday. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Thank you. God bless.